Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're um, if you're new, I also want to welcome you. I'm Charlie, the lead pastor here, and we just finished last week a series where we kind of went uh, through different sections of the Apostles' Creed and kind of talked about things we believe as a as a church. and And in a few weeks, we're going to have our big small group kickoff that we do every year, and we're going to do a, a study in Acts together. I and mean, in this interim time, we're just going to spend a few weeks. We're just going to look at a, a couple of psalms. Mark will be here with us next week, and we're just going to look at a few psalms and just kind of these uh, encouragements um, that that are there and just kind of the emotion that's expressed in psalms, some some powerful stuff there. And I was thinking about this this week, this one in particular, that we're, the psalm we're looking at today is talking just kind of about God's Word and in general. And I, and I, And I was thinking about all this week just how I think that some of us, if not all of us, kind of have a hard time categorizing like what the Bible is, like like what am I supposed to do with it? I think hey, where I'm, I'm a Christian, I know the Bible's important. It, you're supposed to have it. You're supposed to you're supposed to supposed to read it. Good stuff's supposed to happen when you read it. Sometimes I think we're just a little bit intimidated by it. We're not exactly how to attack it. And honestly, I think that um, I, and and I think this is about everything. Christian slogans don't help. Like Christian slogans almost never help. If it's catchy enough to put on your church sign, you probably just should avoid saying it, right? It it and 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 you, like you're struggling. Like I'm I'm trying to figure out how to deal with the Bible, and then and then you drive past and you see it's like the 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 thing is like um, having trouble with life. Try reading the instructions. Hey, I didn't I didn't know life came with instructions, but clearly they mean the Bible, right? The Bible is God's instruction book. It's like I don't know. I'm going to turn to the table of contents. Well, there really is one that makes sense. I'm going to go, go to the index, kind of different category. No, it's really not that. I'm just going to start reading at the beginning. It's like, oh, this is a nice creation story. I don't, this isn't really instructing me on how to do life, but it's a nice little story. And then eventually you get to the point where we're counting the number of Israelites and different tribes, and, 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 and we're talking about how often the priest has to check a white mark on your, on your arm to see if it's leprosy, and you're just like, I'm out. I'm out, and and it's like this is something. It's something, but it's not an instruction book. And there was this thing that was said. I've not heard it in a while. Maybe maybe we officially maybe we maybe we maybe we killed it. And then I'm gonna say it, and you're gonna be like, this is actually my, you know, my Instagram bio or something like that. And I'm gonna feel real bad. Well, they describe describe the Bible as like the Bible is God's love letter to you. Is it? Is it? I mean, it doesn't start dear Charlie for sure. It doesn't start dear any of us really. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of war and killings in this for it to be a very effective love letter. Here, let me show you all, all of the wars that Israel went through for a few thousand years. This is my love letter to you, the description of war. And I'm like, it's, it's not that. But we want it to be. We want it to be this category. It's like this is God declaring his love for me. This is instructions. These are rules. These are guidelines. And in the absence of something really clear and and the fact that it is completely overwhelming, often too many of us, we avoid it. When the reality of it is is too complex to really describe adequately in a short amount of time, it is a series of books, obviously. Most of us know that, 66 Different books written over an incredible span of time by a large number of people. Um, It does have, I think, it it is kind of a one big picture story. A story of God, a story of God who created everything, who loves people, who rebelled against them and his desire to get us back. And in the process of telling these stories, we, we see different examples of how to live. We see examples of not how to live. We see the heart of God. We do see some instructions, I suppose, some commands that are in there. But you take, you take these commands and you take these stories, you take these songs that we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks, and you put all this together and you can get this really complicated but awesome picture of what it is God wants and expects from each one of us. I learn about God and I learn about me. And I think we need to we need to break down this idea that somehow that the Bible is intimidating, that somehow the Bible is inaccessible and not oversimplify it, but at the same time um, embrace it as something that 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 God has for me. 
And so in Psalm 1, at the very beginning of uh, the book of Psalms, again, Psalm, Psalm, let's say Psalm means song, it's uh, uh, 150 of these. The very first one, I think, helps us gain a picture of what it can be like if we have an appropriate and, and, and intentional view of using the scriptures in our lives. So Psalm 1, we're going to look at the whole thing, it's six verses. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. And so what's going on here is there's a contrast, several contrasts are being made between two different people. A person who has this idea of someone who meditates on the law of the Lord, whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and contrasting that with someone who does not have that sort of attitude. And I think it's really good for us to kind of just examine these contrasts and to kind of help us understand, one, the benefits of what it means to have God's Word really be a significant part of our life, and two, I mean, it's, an, it's a great evaluative tool. Like, if, 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 if there are two choices, if there are two camps, where would I describe my life now, and where would I like it to be? So at the very beginning, again, he, 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 has this, you know, he starts off talking about the guy, uh, blessed is the person who doesn't do these things, who is not walking in step with wicked, is not standing in the way that sinners take, sitting in the company of mockers, who is not one of these sinner, mocker, wicked people, but instead you delight in God's word. And so the initial contrast, the initial contrast for this, this whole thing is, is whether or not we're living a biblical life or a sinful life. A biblical life versus a sinful life. Are you someone who, when you think about the way that my life should be, how my life should be directed, what, what, what decisions I should make, am I allowing God's word to give input to that? Would I describe myself as someone who is living according to the principles? I know God's word. I know what I know about him. I know what is true about me. I know what God wants from me. I know what he expects from me. And this is how I'm trying to live. Or am I someone who, again, described this way, in step with wicked, standing, walking where sinners walk, sitting in the company of people who mock God, right? And I was thinking about this for me this week. I was, I was hanging out with a friend, and, and something happened this week. And it was it was it was a little bit stressful. Where where someone who just kind of has it's just I, it's, it's just someone who doesn't like me. I'll just say that someone who doesn't like me, and and they have they have reemerged in a way that was that was hurtful. And I was um I, w- I was I was sitting with a with a friend, and and I said, you know what I'd really like to do, and then I said something not nice. I said something that wasn't nice, and this was a good friend, and he let me say it, which was good. He just kind of let me say it, and it just kind of sat there for a while, and then he goes, well, but, you know, I'm like, yeah, I know, and it was good. It was it was the right kind of thing. It was like the right thing for him to say, where it's like, he just kind of let me just kind of vent a little bit, but at the same time, man, it is very important. For all of us, I mean, he didn't give me the especially you pastor kind of deal, but it was a little bit in there. It's like, but you know, it, it's important. But remember, this is who God has called us to be. Remember, I mean, remember the values. Like, there, there's this part of me, there's like, there's this part of all of us that thinks like, I just want to just let it out. I just want to, I just want to, I, I want to do what they're doing. I want to do to them what they're doing to me. Or you just, you have this and it's like, blessed is the one who can avoid that, who can avoid a life of revenge, who can avoid a life of anger and hate. 
but can instead can live according to who God has called them to be. You know, I, I said, I said, if, if I could do this without consequences, this is what I would do. But the reality of it is, there isn't anything that you can do that doesn't have consequences. And blessed is the one who sees that and lives that way. And again, I think we, it is very clear to all of us that we live in a world that is full of evil. And if you follow the news, we have um, reasons to believe that. Again, um, where just in, in, in one day we have two mass shootings where just evil is running rampant. And, and, and murder seems casual to too many people. And I feel confident to say, I mean, that that, that, that is not the sort of people that are here today. We are not the kind of people who are plotting mass murder. But what it's talking about here is not just simply don't be the worst people. It also says don't sit where they sit, don't walk where they walk. And I wonder sometimes, there's a lot of evil in the world. Are we sitting with them? There's a lot of anger and hate in the world. And maybe we're not expressing it, but are we sitting next to it? Are we walking where it walks? You know, anytime something bad like this happens, political Twitter, political social media just kind of blows up in the worst ways. And, and, and suddenly you just have some of the worst things that ever get said get said after something bad happens. And depending on what the bad thing is and who did the bad thing, why they did the bad thing, you know, you've got two different groups. Well, this is something I can use. We can use this to our advantage to get them, and we can use this one to our advantage to get them, and then these vile, ugly things get said. And too many times... It is the vile, ugly things that inspire some of these things. So I'm not, I'm not doing the thing. I'm not, not necessarily tweeting that or posting that. These hurtful, awful, hate-filled things that we say. But I'm, I'm just going to click like. Or, man, I'm not going to click like. I'm, I'm going I'm gonna, to I'm gonna like it. And I think too often we have allowed ourselves to get sucked into a world where maybe, again, we're not doing the bad things. We're not doing the worst things. But we sit close enough to them where we're not bringing light and hope and love, but we're allowing hate and anger to exist, and we just kind of... We walk in step with it. We we standing where kind of where they stand. We kind of sit at a distance with it. But what God has called us to be is the people who delight in the law of the Lord and who meditate on his law day and night. That I'm not going to allow myself to get sucked into so much that this world has that is that is externally, physically destructive. And it's also emotionally and spiritually destructive. It's not, it's not just that I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to keep my distance from it as well. And so the contrast here, am I someone who stands with wicked? Am I someone who stands with sinners, sits in the company of mockers, or is my delight in God's word? A biblical life versus a sinful life. You continue on, and he describes kind of what that person is like. Verse 3. He says, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. So again, you're just imagining here, he's kind of using an illustration, you've got two kinds of plants of sorts, right? You've got this tree, this solid tree, right by the river with deep roots that go all into the river, that no matter what happens, that tree's not going anywhere. 
and then you've you've got just kind of you know it's kind of this thing that's kind of just blowing around in the wind. This chaff, this is like one gust of wind, and that thing is gone. It gets wiped out. And again, the question is, which one of these are us? It's biblical life versus a sinful life. It's stability versus instability. Would I describe myself as someone who is living a rooted, stable life? I know who I am. I know who God has called me to be. I feel solid in that. And it does not matter what wind blows, what storm comes. I am rooted by the river. Or am I someone like chaff that the wind just blows away? All it takes is one gust of wind and everything that I think that I am, everything that I say I am, gets completely discarded. Which one of those describes? Because we're both talking about plants. We're both talking about things that, you know, that, that, are, that are in the ground. That ta- they, they, they're the same except for their ability to, ex- to uh, stand against difficult circumstances. And again, I have to f- fuss at myself here again. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, it's nine years, my family and I. We moved here nine years ago. It was nine years ago, August 1st. was my first sermon here. If you weren't there, a few of you were there. It's a legendary day. I was wearing a Super Grover t-shirt because I thought that was fun coming to the Grove, and I sweated through it. It was a great t-shirt, giant band of sweat right here, about 10 minutes in. It was beautiful. It was a great introduction. Um, it was nine years ago, and uh, the house that we owned in the town that we moved from, we still own. And we don't want to own it. We're not trying to own it, but we still do. And we put it back on the market two weeks ago. And in those two weeks, it has had exactly one showing. And our realtor said, you know, it's just it's something, something happened. It's like, it's, it's amazing. It's like, you put, you put your house on the market. It's like, it's like, it's like it just something happens. Like, now no houses are getting shown anywhere is, is what our realtor was saying to us. Like, none of my listings are being shown. And I'm like, I'm sorry we jinxed you. I'm sorry that our involvement in your life is now causing you problems. It, it, is, it is definitely us. It's not you. It's not the market. It's us. It's our, your involvement with me. You should, you should break our contract so you can be successful. Um, and that's frustrating. It's been a frustrating two weeks. And, and there's just been some other things that have happened this week. It just, it just feels like piling on. You ever had a week like that? had a year like that you ever had a a life like that where it just feels like things just pile and you think to yourself if everything were good I could be good and, and I and I think that's what we think I think that's how we live if just everything could be good I could be good That's not life. And our strength and our stability is determined by our ability to weather the very natural storm. Because it's an interesting thing that's said here in Psalm 1. It says that, you know, the, 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 the yield, your fruit, got the big fruit, it's planted by the water, doesn't wither, whatever they do prospers. And contrast that with the wimp, this thing is getting blown away. It's interesting that he says that whatever you do prospers. When at the same time he's describing what two different people go through when a storm comes. Prospering does not look like the avoidance of a storm. Uh, prospering does not look like storms never happen. It doesn't mean that, that, that nothing will ever happen to me that gives me any sort of problem or anxiety or won't do some damage maybe to, to, to parts of whatever it is that I am. But prospering means that no matter what happens, no matter what this world throws out, because of where my roots are, because of the stability that I have, because of where I am getting the water and the food that I need, there is nothing that can, big picture, really do any damage to me. And in that sense, 
you will prosper. We do not want to read the word prosper and say that somehow that the wind will stop blowing, that the storm will stop, that the trial will end. But you, you will prosper if you are the person who has the roots where they need to be. And again, I am familiar with God's word. I know who God is. I know what he is like. I know what I am like, and I know what this God expects from me. And I am doing what I can to live this way. And if I live this way, if I live according to what God's word says, then I, then, then I can be like this tree. I can be like a tree that is planted by streams of water. I, can, I have fruit when it's time to have fruit, and I am strong when it's time to be strong. And no matter what the season, no matter what the weather, I will prosper. I want to say this again because there's, there's two things that I think that happen to people. And again, as with most things, there's two extremes. If I say to you, you commit your life to God's word and in every way you will prosper. We hear one of two things. We hear, nothing bad will happen to me. I will be rich and have lots of money and stuff and everything will be good. Which is ridiculous. Which is dumb. No one should ever believe that. No one who follows Jesus, who lived a life of abject poverty and was tortured and murdered, should think that, the closer you are to God, the better your life will be in that sense. Right? I mean, you're not going to be closer to God than Jesus was. Right? He did it perfect, and he had the worst of it. Okay? So let's make sure we get that clear. And so then on the other hand, we think, I'm just not going to use the word prosper then. Because I don't want to communicate anything false to you. And I don't want to associate myself with the people who say this weird thing about what prosper means. And so then I'm scared to tell you that if you will plant your roots with God's word in uh, uh, whatever you do, you'll prosper. I, I don't want to say that to you because I'm afraid that you might miss it. You might mis- misunderstand me. And I think I've decided with some things I'd rather you a little bit misunderstand me and, and believe that God's desire is to prosper you, and you figure it out with God exactly what that means, than to me be afraid to tell you that God wants to prosper you in everything that you do. Sometimes it will have physical side effects. Sometimes it may even have a financial side effect. But who you are in the life that you are trying to live, in your journey of being and becoming the man, the woman that God has called you to be, you will prosper. You will prosper in the seasons where you're supposed to have fruit. You'll prosper in the seasons where all your leaves fall off. You'll prosper whatever the weather is. Whatever happens, you will prosper. Now I encourage you, we know what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean nothing. And it doesn't mean no pain and all the money. What does it mean? I don't know. Go plant your roots deep in God's word and living according to who God has called you to be. And then you tell me what it means. Because it will mean something and it will be very personal and direct and specific to you. And God will prosper you. So it hasn't been a great week. And and, and, and I'm I'm not trying to pat myself on the back or anything, but it hasn't been a great week, right? I said some ugly things. I wanted to say uglier things. I've been frustrated. I, I, mi- I missed a couple of nights sleep, right? And here, I'm here. I'm here. I am still planted. I am still rooted. And I believe somewhere that God is going to continue to prosper me. He is going to continue to do this in my life. He's going to continue to do this in our family life. And my promise is that he is going to do the same thing for you. If we will have our roots by God's river. So we have a biblical life versus a sinful life. And then he goes on to describe again that we can have stability versus instability. And then finally he ends up 
saying this in verse 5. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So there's going to be a judgment. If you were here last week, we talked about this. There's, there's going to be a judgment. And in this judgment, God is going to separate the righteous from the unrighteous. And it says right here, the wicked aren't going to be able to stand. They're, they're, they're going to be cast aside. And they're not going to be in this assembly of the righteous people. But in, because God watches over the, the righteous people, but the people who live a wicked life, it leads to destruction. So it's a biblical life versus a sinful life. It's stability versus instability. And ultimately, it's protection versus destruction. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So you have a couple of choices here. I can live a life where I am under the protection of the Almighty God who loves me more than I even understand the word love. Or I can live a way that leads to destruction, which is really interesting. One is God's protection. One is the absence of God's protection. And the absence of God's protection, what that is, is that is that is a life that leads to its own destruction. And I think it's important for you to know that. There's God's protection, and then there's you destroying yourself. And that's the contrast. We can have protection or destruction. Now, if you've been around for any of these nine years, I would be surprised if you've not heard this illustration that I'm about to use. I use this illustration all the time. I talk about it all the time. In different contexts, I talk about it in parenting contexts, talk about it in sin contexts, talk about it in understanding who the, nat- the very nature of God, uh, what does it mean for uh, there to be a Bible command. I talk about this all the time. And the reason I talk about it, lots of times I try to say new things, right, keep it fresh. But sometimes there's just some illustrations that I think are so important that we need to make sure that we have them deep. And so if you're new, I want you to hear it for the first time. And if you've heard it before, I want you to hear it again because I want it to be real to you, right? So we're talking about what it means to be in God's protection versus a way that leads to destruction. Now, if I say to you, if, if, if all I had said to you was, here's what you need to do, guys. This, I read Psalm 1. You need to read the Bible, and anytime there's a command, you need to write it down. You need to do what God says. If God says do it, you do it. If God says don't do it, don't do it. That's what the Bible is. Now just go do that. That ain't starting to. Now, I'm, I'm ready to fight somebody, right? Because what? Because nobody tells me what to do. Because I'm an American. And nobody tells me what to do. And if you tell me what to do, I now got to do the opposite just to prove to you that you can't tell me what to do. Anybody ever done that? I, like, like, you're going to do, like, like you're going to do the dishes, and as you're going on your way to do the dishes, somebody said, hey, will you do the dishes? Like, well, I was going to. Now I got to not because you told me to, right? Uh, you're probably a nicer person than me. All right? So we, 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 we don't like commands because we think of commands in terms of control. Someone is trying to control me. And we think that... Um, that, 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 that any control, any limitation on my freedom is necessarily a bad thing. And so what I like to talk about, I like to talk about fences. And there's really, a, I mean, there's more than this, obviously, but since essentially fences break down into two categories. Prison fences and fences that you put in the backyard when you have a rambunctious toddler. Right? So what does a prison fence do? A prison fence blocks in and keeps in all of the bad things and, and makes and limits their freedom and protects the things on the outside of the fence from the bad things on the inside of the fence. And I think any time I say command and limit on your freedom, that's what you think, prison fence. God is trying to limit my freedom. He's trying to limit my fun. He's trying to limit my access. Most of the good things, really, honestly, if you ever read the Bible, most of the good things are on the outside of the fence. God puts all the bad things in the fence to test me, and really all the good things are on the other side of the fence. Well, that's not what Psalm 1 says. Psalm 1 says if you live outside God's fence, there's destruction, which again leads to the other type of fence, the toddler fence. Why do you build a fence in the backyard when you have a toddler? Well, because I'm trying to protect the toddler from the destruction. 
when our when our Lauren was three years old, the 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 house that we had didn't have a fence, and we we locked her inside for two months until we could get that fence built. It was our top priority because she was wild. She ran nonstop, and if she saw anything that looked awesome, she would run to it. And we were right next to a major road, and there was a pond in the backyard and a giant rock, and there was just all of these things. You just look at it, and you could just imagine all of the different ways that Lauren Lofton could kill or hurt herself. You could just see them everywhere. And so we built a fence to protect this thing that was very precious to us from all of the things that could hurt her. Now... We eventually got a swing set, and she had a lot of outdoor toys, and I want to ask you, where do you think we put the swing set? Inside the fence or outside the fence? Inside the fence. Where do you think we kept her toys? Inside the fence. Where were the trucks going 45 miles an hour on the road? Outside the fence. Where was the pond? Outside the fence. That pond sure looks fun, though. Yeah. But you need to know, jumping off that rock probably would seem fun too. Chasing that truck, that seems fun. But the fun, the life, is in the fence. And inside the fence, where all of the good things are, you have protection. Outside of the fence is a path that leads to destruction. And so, I'm going to live according to God's word. I'm not going to stand where they stand. I'm not going to sit where they sit. I'm not going to talk like they talk. But I'm going to live a life according to his word. And I'm not going to be some kind of person that allows myself that just even one little puff of wind and I'm just undone. I'm going to plant my roots deep into God's word. And then the more I understand his commands and his call on my life and who his character is, I recognize he's not trying to control my freedom. He's trying to get me to understand and experience his protection and to keep me from living a life that is my own destruction. So, I think I'm a decent enough communicator that I don't have to ask, which one do you want to be, right? I mean, I don't know. I think I've sold it pretty well, maybe. How would we describe where we are? And what steps do we need to take to just take some more steps? Kind of like, I'm just going to read his, read his word a little bit differently. I'm going to read it a little bit better. I'm going to read it a little more thoroughly. I'm going to understand it a little bit better. I'm going to do what I can to plant my roots deep so that I can understand what it is that God wants from me so that my life can prosper. So as we, um, as we worship and respond, I just encourage you, just confess the sitting with the wicked and standing with the scoffers. Confess that and ask God to deepen your roots and to make you someone who is committed to what his word has to say for your life. As always, there's places to respond in the back. Communion is available. There's, there's prayer candles, pray at the cross. Our prayer team is back there. If you've got a concern or prayer, they would love to be praying for you. They've been praying for you all morning already. We have an opportunity to give. We're going to worship. Let's give our hearts fully to Him and ask God to help us live the life under His protection rather than destruction. Let's pray. God, I thank you. God, I thank you for your word. And God, I do confess that it is often a little intimidating to us. It, it, we're a little overwhelmed by it. We don't understand it. And, and we're, we're scared of things that aren't sometimes that just aren't easy to understand. But God, I pray that you would release us from that fear and intimidation. And God, that you would just help us recognize that God, that it is in your word where life, where life is. That as we understand your character, as we understand more about who we are, and we understand, God, your expectations for, for us. God, I pray that we would learn about those, that, would, that our passion for that would grow, and that our lives would reflect, God, who it is you want us to be. So, God, I pray that you would make us men and women who are committed to your word. And um, as always, we thank you for your son who gave his life for us. And it's in his name that we pray.
Amen.